One, two, three, can you hear me? I hope so. It's a little bug floating around. Srpska me zove, ali ja se ne odazivam. In light of our recent rally of Serbs, which took place in Banja Luka on April 18th, 2024, this is how my video starts. I will preface this by saying that this video's main focus is politics. It is not a comedic video. I will not be doing shaky handheld comedic sketches where I zoom in and say the funny haha punchline. And most importantly, I won't be laughing at anything that is going on right now because it's frankly not that funny. If anything, these events are quite worrying. So if you expect to have a hearty laugh, you're doing yourself a disservice by watching this video. Instead, go watch the video about a Russian propaganda poster about women's suffrage, which I make fun of. And to those who remain, not much is left to do but to begin. My name is David Klopić. For as long as I've been alive, which is 23 years, I've lived in a small town in Bosnia and Herzegovina called Brčko. It is a lovely town, and not just because I was born there, and I'm thus expected to love it. I know its ins and outs. I went to elementary and high school there. I witnessed stores open and close down. I saw the largest shopping complex in northeast Bosnia being open in my vicinity, an old shopping mall from nearly 10 years ago being given new life, new buses and proper timetables being introduced, a new university being built, and even a kiosk at a recently constructed roundabout in place of traffic lights being reopened after it was previously seized by the government for tax evasion. In short, it really feels like I've grown in this town, and the town along with me. But my town is special in itself. To understand this, you need to know that our country consists of two entities. The Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which itself is split up into 10 cantons, and the Republic of Srpska, or Republika Srpska, the focus of this video, which has municipalities. But if you look at the map, you'll see the confines of a third entity, which is both in the hands of the other two entities and simultaneously autonomous. Within these confines I myself live, and it is called the Brčko district. I like to think that we live in a microstate, like my parents do, as we are still bound by the constitution, but at the same time we are our own little state, with access to the Croatian border, the Sava River, the harbor, and the beautiful countryside where I'm recording this video, as well as a separate budget, separate health services, and of course, we still have people from different ethnic nationalities, Bosniaks, Serbs, and Croats. That being said, for how long I've lived here, I couldn't help but notice that Republika Srpska has a tighter grip on the district than its federative counterpart. As you drive under the railway, you are met with a billboard featuring Ivica Dacic. And who is this guy? Well, he is a politician in Serbia. He was former prime minister of the country as well. But he's not the only one. When Serbian elections took place, a poster of Aleksandar Vucic, incumbent president of Serbia, was also seen in our town. And why should I care about what is happening in Serbia? Is it because I'm a Serb myself? Apparently so. Also, instead of paying for radio television of Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have to pay an RTV tax every month to a different kind of television owned by Republika Srpska. Given my circumstances, one may say that I am a so-called Bosnian Serb. That is to say, a Serb that lives in Bosnia. But with the recent events which are happening in my, con in my country and the region, mainly Serbia and Srpska, I felt more and more compelled to instead call myself just Bosnian, who happens to be of Serbian ethnicity. But enough deliberation. Let's talk about it. The main focus of the rally, which took place in Banja Luka, pertains to a United Nations resolution on the Srebrenica massacre, which saw the mass killings of exactly 8,372 of the so-called non-Serbs, that is to say, Bosniaks and Croats, by the army of Republika Srpska and the Scorpions, which is a paramilitary unit in Serbia. According to the resolution, July 11th, when the massacre had begun, would be recognized as the International Day of Reflection and Remembrance of the 1995 Srebrenica Genocide. 
This is done in the same fashion as the International Day of Reflection on the 1994 Rwandan Genocide and the International Holocaust Remembrance Day for Germany. Both countries in which these mass killings had occurred suggested that Bosnia should get its own Remembrance Day. Personally, I'm fine with this resolution passing. It doesn't affect me one bit, and neither should it affect my fellow Serbs. But that didn't stop tens of thousands of other Serbs from gathering at a rally titled Srpska Tezove to say that this mass killing was not genocide. Whether it was or not doesn't really matter. What matters is that this is an attempt to undermine the massacre itself, which is to say that what the Bosnian Serb forces had done in 1995 was not a huge deal. Obviously, loss of life of over 8,000 innocent Bosniaks and Croats, while fading in comparison to at least 500,000 Tutsi being slaughtered in Rwanda, was a heinous crime which, thankfully, most perpetrators were held accountable for, and is in fact a huge deal. Notable cases are Radovan Karadzic, former president of Republika Srpska, and Radko Mladic, leader of the Srpska army. Both gentlemen are currently, and rightfully so, serving a life sentence for facilitating the massacre. An argument often brought up against the resolution is that it seeks to label Serbs as genocidal people, no matter if some strongly condemned the killings which took place in Srebrenica and during the Yugoslav wars themselves. However, according to a few reports made on this subject, I was able to deduce that Serbs are not directly mentioned in it. Sure, those who perpetrated the massacre are undoubtedly genocidal, and they seem to have no remorse about it either. But to label an entire group of people as prone to committing acts of genocide is completely absurd. You don't see the same thing apply to Germans, who, under the command of Adolf Hitler, were responsible for 6 million Jewish deaths. It's just Serb politicians playing the victim of war which ended 30 years ago. Another bizarre argument in support of the massacre is but generals of Bosnia and Croatian ethnicity killed our people too. So? Does this make killing of other people okay in your eyes? Does this warrant 8,000 civilian deaths in less than a single month? Does this mean you get to celebrate war criminals and write that Ratko Mladic is a hero on walls of buildings? Ratko Mladic, the same person who was responsible in the first place for ordering the execution of Bosniaks and Croats, their men and children. And you still have the audacity to underestimate the repercussions of this massacre, by and large considered a genocide, by denying it ever happened and saying it is a fabrication to make Serbs look bad? Now, on the subject of Serb killings, by Nasser Oric, for example, I strongly condemn those actions too. In fact, I condemn all killings that took place, are taking place, and will be taking place at any time and anywhere on this round earth. But once again, what Serbian politicians fail to see is that retaliation is never a good answer to anything. And nobody is denying that Serbs were victims of certain crimes against them. See Yasenovac and Stara Gradishka in Croatia. What I'm trying to say is, what's happened has happened. But until we learn to reconcile the past, swear never to repeat any of these heinous actions ever again and move on, we, Bosniaks, Croats and Serbs alike, will always be bound in the worst way. That is, through our hatred towards the other ethnicity. If the United Nations General Assembly passes a resolution which will recognize July 11th as an International Observance Day of the Srebrenica Massacre, or Genocide, this will not, by any stretch of the imagination, have an effect on the Serbian people, whether or not they are politically inclined. It has only served as a reminder of a horrible time which ensued almost immediately after the dissolution of Yugoslavia. Nothing more, nothing less. On the topic of the rally itself, one of the spokespeople, Branimir Kojic, said that every Serb should loudly proclaim that what had happened was not genocide, but once again, by doing so, they are only really helping acquit their own military officers of the crimes they have committed. And to Darko Banyac, a reminder that nobody is taking away your cauldron for brandy and the tenderloin, there is no such thing as parent 1 and parent 2, and being part of the Europe of faggots should be the ultimate goal of this country even if I personally believe it won't happen anytime soon, or even during my lifetime. I couldn't be bothered to watch the rest of the rally because, uh, frankly, it's SNSD drivel. One more highlight, however. Binance even said that Russia's only mistake as regards the special military operation, that is to say a full-scale war, was that it wouldn't go beyond Ukraine to exterminate all fascists and Nazis, uh, none of whom in theory have existed since 1945. As I said earlier, most of the perpetrators haven't attained and are serving, or have served, time in prison. 
But now I would like to mention an article from Oslobodjenia, namely an opinion piece titled The Genocide. Three of the perpetrators said there was one. Fittingly, it mentions three collaborators in the massacre who have, unlike most of their colleagues, admitted to having committed this heinous crime. These people are Momir Nikolic, Dragan Obrenovic, and Dražen Nerdimovic. This may be a random assortment of names and surnames, but these people do exist. They just never made a return to Republika Srpska in fear of being assassinated for treason against the Serbian nation. What they've done was horrible. I agree with that. But lying about it is even more so. And I think, given their willingness to cooperate in the rehabilitation, they do deserve a second chance. Nikolic was at first sentenced to 27 years, then the sentence was reduced to 22 years in prison, but was eventually freed in 2014 and granted political asylum in Sweden. Obrenovic was sentenced to 17 years in jail in 2003, but was freed in 2017, having served most of his sentence, and nobody really knows where he is or if he even has the same name. He did, however, initially plead not guilty. But the case of Erdemovic is a particularly saddening one. He didn't want to shoot at the civilians, but he ultimately gave in because his superior said to join them if he refused to carry out his duty. He was sentenced to 10 years, later reduced to 5, and even later didn't serve any time, but was instead granted asylum in Switzerland. Now, nobody who participated in the massacre deserves to be celebrated. But you mean to tell me that people who opted to tell the truth, to expose the ulterior motives of the irredentist genocidal individuals, and even actively testified against the people who had been complicit in the genocide, deserve to be vilified instead of the people they testified against? The people who deeply regret their decisions, instead of the people who said they would do it all over again because Serbs are just superior. The people who might be out of jail by now, instead of people rotting in their cells. If Srebrenica genocide denial was an Olympic discipline, then Milorad Dodik would be holding the world record for most instances of denying it. It's in his blood. What is also in his blood is his Serbian nationalism, maybe even ultra-nationalism. His undying devotion to incumbent Russian president and authoritarian ruler Vladimir Putin, and his threats to get Srebrenica to succeed over every little thing that bothers him. Take, for example, Amendments to the Bosnian election law imposed by our country's high representative, Christian Schmidt, which would make our upcoming elections that much fairer. In response, he decided to sign a separate election law exclusive to Srpska. The implications of such a move are quite interesting. It's as if Dodik's political career is waning, and he thus has to pass a law that will allow him indefinite rule. Before that, he signed into law a resolution which recriminalized defamation, meaning I can no longer chant Nodik Dodik, or the equally catchy Diklas Dodik, without getting into trouble. He threatened to arrest a high representative if he as much as stepped foot onto the territory of Republika Srpska. Did I mention that we might be getting a law on foreign agents soon? Or that he banned LGBT organizations and its correspondents from simply entering schools? Or that he's actively working on annulling any and all decisions of the high representative, or that he wants Srpska to succeed, and or join the Republic of Serbia, a country they have close ties with, which has its own fair share of problems and corrupt politicians? Milan Radoric is right about one thing, however. Domestically speaking, Republika Srpska is, or at least feels like, more of a country than Bosnia and Herzegovina as a whole is. If not yet, it will be as more things get introduced following the election law. They already have their own army, national anthem, national television. So what's next? Their own currency? Their own capital that isn't Sarajevo? I would love to and simultaneously hate to see such a development occur, but ultimately it won't matter for I might be gone from the country at that point, trying to become an English teacher, a functioning member of society. That being said, some oversight on Dodik's part. Firstly, no, you will not arrest me the moment I walk into Srpska for saying not exotic in public, because that's not how it works. Srpska is a part of Bosnia. It is an entity, and there are no border patrols between it and the Federation. And, even if Srpska somehow managed to gain independence, and chances of that happening are practically impossible, but never zero, unfortunately, it'd be awkward to put border patrols between the two countries, as the border would look like a scribble of a five-year-old. Yes, it would be that stupid a border. Uh, let's not go into detail about how this would affect the Brčko district as well, having in mind Srpska's tight grip on the third entity. Secondly, an anti-defamation law is detrimental to a healthy, functioning country. I agree that nobody likes to be insulted ad hominem, 
and insults entirely based on a person's religious, sexual, racial, and national characteristics should not be condoned. But the problem arises when only certain individuals are immune to it. It's exactly like that phrase, rules for thee, but not for me. Dudek has free reign to insult anyone who doesn't agree with him by pulling such classic words as Alapacha, Krava, Goveda Blesavo, and so on and so forth, while me saying Nordic Dodik will land me in prison for inciting violence, or will get me a hefty fine for which I have no way of paying. When I say Dodik, I really mean anyone who enables him, which is most, if not the entirety, of the National Assembly of Republika Srpska, excluding Zhitka Tsuyanovic, who is literally Dodik's right-hand woman, who is at the time of recording serving as the Serbian member of the Bosnian Triumvirate, alongside the Croat Željko Komšić and the Bosniak Denis Bečirovic. Thirdly, the foreign agents law is literally straight out of the Russian Federation, no doubt about it. For those who don't know, on July 20, 2012, Vladimir Putin signed into law amendments regarding regulation of activities of non-governmental organizations which are performing the functions of a foreign agent, as a response to protests due to his re-election in the same year. It serves no other purpose but to oppress media outlets and free thinkers, critical of Putin's iron fist. In the same vein, this kind of law will also seriously infringe on our right to free speech, as organizations and people who hold opposing views and those of Dodik and Co, which is a term coined by Oslobodjenia, by the way, will have to label the cells as organizations under the influence of the foreign agents and be subjected to additional audits or else face fines and potentially liquidation. Reminder that this law really only applies to Republika Srpska and it hopefully won't have any power in the larger Bosnian entity. Still, it is a worrisome development and who knows what kind of law comes next. I wouldn't be surprised if Dodik doubled down on his homophobic rhetoric by enacting Putin-inspired law on the preservation of traditional values and regarding denial of such values. A new Russia sounds exactly what we need in a country with one pro-Kremlin individual too many. Dodik's children are no better either. In fact, his daughter, whom I will not name, recently posted a reply on X, formerly Twitter, where N1 asks Dodik to apologize to one of their journalists whom he called a cow off camera. And her response was, and I quote, I also agree that he should apologize. But to the cows, because he insulted them by comparing them to this reporter. What can I say other than, like father, like daughter? During the Rebedu festival in Dubrovnik, Dinko Gruhonic, a journalist and a professor at the Faculty of Humanities in Novi Sad, might have had an unorthodox start to his speech. Namely, he introduced himself by his name, suggested how people who knew him came up with a Zani nickname, Sabahudin, and then said he already, quote, has a very beautiful name, Dinko, like Dinko Šakić, who, by the way, was an Ustasha, a kind of Croatian Nazi, who hated Serbs with a burning passion, until his very death. So obviously this kind of comment might have been a risky move, but that's all it was, a comment, a joke, albeit a dark one. It was a joke which might have reminded us all of the past in which many Serbs perished just as much as every other nation on the Balkans. And because of this, many of his students weren't having it. They blocked the entrance to the university and demanded his resignation as a professor, citing hate speech. And here's the kicker. The video in which he commented about his name was actually an edit, making it seem as if Gruhonic was glorifying his fascist, ultra-nationalistic, serbophobic, anti-Semitic, and generally misanthropic namesake. These people were literally looking for a bone to pick with a professor, and they intended to get it in any way they could. And who else joined the charade of calling the professor out for his less than innocuous but still somewhat innocuous joke? Why President of Serbia, Aleksandar Vucic, as well as his Serbian Progressive Party. Progressive my ass. <clears throat> Pardon my French. Anyway, Vucic also happens to be a fervent opponent of the previously mentioned UNGA's resolution on the massacre, is responsible for corruption-ridden elections in which he and his party won, has close ties to both Milorad Dodik and especially the Kremlin, hasn't resolved the Kosovo issue which is impeding the road to the EU, and is often a host to television stations where he continues to spread his propaganda through his so-called national journal. And yes, that right there was a reference to Pink Media Group, whose CEO doesn't care about the safety of his people, but money. Now, students want to block the entrance to get the faculty management to reconsider his employment? 
I kind of understand. But some of the protesters who accused him of hate speech turned out to be absolute hypocrites, for as soon as his speech was released, Gruhonic received countless death threats, which he has probably been receiving them for as long as he was a reporter, and a warm message of welcome waiting for him at the entrance to his flat, which read, Dinko Shakic, you're ready for eternal homeland. What does it mean, you might be wondering? Well, it comes from Croatian Zadom Spremni, which literally means for home ready, is an Ustasha greeting very reminiscent of Nazi Germany's Sieg Heil or Heil Hitler. In other words, the people who advocate against hate speech, not that there is anything wrong with advocating against it really, are the same people actively engaging in it, in turn endangering the life of an innocent reporter and people like him. I think it's obvious whose side I'm on, and while I think Ruhonich went a little far with that statement, I wasn't offended by it. Maybe it's his sense of humor. Maybe it's him exercising his right to free speech like any sane person would. But people who send them death threats are far from sane. And it's because of these people that Serbia is developing backwards. Am I an anti-Serb for choosing to express myself like this? Far from it. It's not like I'm changing the ethnic nationality I was born with. I have always been a Serb and I won't forsake it. I don't even hate my fellow people just like I don't hate any other nation. Issue is that I've become increasingly more worried over the future of this country because of people like Dodik and those who enable him. And while I'm usually not disinvested in politics, somebody had to say it and I hope I'm not the only one. And even if I leave this country in a year or two to seek a better life, Bosnia and Herzegovina will always be a place I was born and raised in, and I mustn't take that for granted. This is why, instead of Bosnian Serb, I identify as Bosnian, not Bosniak, which is different. Uh, who is by coincidence a Serb too. I may have mentioned this earlier, but let me reiterate that what I've said about a certain group of radical Serbs does not encompass all of them. That would be a stark overgeneralization. Those radical Serbs who seek a so-called greater Serbia should instead seek therapy at the hospital. The war is over in theory, but its profound effects on our society are still felt in each Bosnian town in both entities, plus the Brčko district. No nation can ever be genocidal. That title belongs to individuals who had, and have, a tendency to commit such acts without remorse. See Ratko Mladic, Radovan Karadzic, Vojadin Popovic, and so on. If saying the truth makes me a traitor of my own people, if acknowledging the mass murders that occurred in the entire Balkans region, not just Srebrenica, as nothing short of genocide, makes me a Serb by occupation, as Dodik eloquently put it, if my largely neutral stance on the Kosovo issue, which is really Serbia's issue that needs to be solved before they can be admitted into the EU, makes me that same nod Serb that had his throat slashed in 1995, then damn it, pardon my French again, I will bear any of those titles with pride. I may not have been born at least five years earlier to see the killings happen, but there is certainly proof of it. A graveyard and a memorial center in Potocari, whose intention is to immortalize those civilians who are no longer with us. Do I seriously need to repeat why any killings, whether by Serb, Bosnia, Croat, Russian, Israeli or Nazi German forces is bad? At this point I'm regurgitating everything like a five-year-old who just learned basic morality. To support my claims a little bit, I will briefly mention Željko Kopanja, a late journalist and respected donor of Nezavisne Novine, who was a victim of a car bombing in 1999 because he had openly called for condemnation of Bosnian Serb crimes. He himself had even said that only individuals were capable of being labeled as genocidal or criminal, not entire nations. It's ridiculous that Serbian politicians today can even conceive that notion, and they are most likely doing it to divide their own people even more so than the alleged UNGA's resolution. Hell, I asked my own mother what she thought about labeling Serbs as genocidal. And her answer should be clear. I'm not afraid of posting this video. In fact, I hardly expect this video to get any traction. My channel has less than 300 subscribers, and I don't think that the number will change much. I originally planned on recording this speech in Serbian, as it's my mother tongue and some of the things I've said would have made a bit more sense, but I opted against it for two reasons. Firstly, because Dodik doesn't deserve to hear me speak the same language as his, and most likely he doesn't speak any other language. Maybe he speaks a little bit of Russian though. I don't know, let's try it. Как дела, Нодик, Додик? Возможно, ты опоздаешь на встречу с Путином? Хм? 
<clears throat> now the second reason is because it allows me to express myself better, as bizarre as that sounds. Sure, you'll be asking yourself as you're watching this video, what is an alapatra? But I can assure you that I will elaborate upon any foreign words in post-production. As for the people of my country and the ones nearby, I won't forget to subtitle my speech into all three languages, Serbian, Bosnian and Croatian. By doing so, I may miss some discrepancies between the three languages, so if there are any mistakes I've made, feel free to point them out, or if you can, correct them. Now I'm going to shamelessly plug in my social networks on the screen. I even have an X account, which I don't use as much. That's because my social media presence is somewhat minimal, but if you have an account on any of these, and want to send me a message about how I'm a traitor who deserves to have his citizenship revoked, then please, send them my way. I'll read them with pleasure. All jokes aside, if you have similar experiences as I do, and want to vent about the ongoing crisis in the region, send me a message. If commenting is more of your thing, you're welcome to do that as well. Let's keep the comment section as civil as possible, please. To conclude this speech, a TLDR if you will. I, a Bosnian who is also a Serb, refuse to associate myself with people who are threatening instability of this country, both politicians and ordinary people alike. I refuse Milorad Dodik as a president and a public figure in general. He's someone who doesn't want a greater Serbia, but a greater Russia. And while I have absolutely nothing against the Russian people themselves, it is the Russian government whose steps Dodik wants to take, and which will in turn be the thing to divide our country and stir up more conflict in the region, not a UN resolution with virtually no mention of the aggressors. Thank you.